you, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the Majeska Simpkin School of Human Rights. Uh, today, of course, is May 15th, 2023. And today we're welcoming a special guest, uh, Bill Fletcher, who is a noted activist and scholar of, of labor organizing in the United States. Today, he's going to talk a bit about what it takes to actually resist repression from federal, state, and local authorities, which is always a recurring theme when talking about a people's history of both South Carolina and United States writ large. Now, today also falls on a particularly important anniversary when we're talking about repression and oppression by federal and state authority. For those of you who do not know, today is the 53rd anniversary of the tragic shootings at Jackson State College in Mississippi in 1970. On May 15, 1970, two students at Jackson State were shot and killed. 12 others were seriously wounded by the police. Those students were protesting primarily against the Vietnam War and American intervention in Cambodia. What's important to note is that that day of tragedy came on the heels of two other tragedies, one you've probably heard of before and one not quite as well known. Uh, the Kent State shooting occurred May 4th of that same year where four students were killed. And then May 11th and 13th of 1970, there was the Augusta riot in which six people were killed and numerous others were also injured. Uh, May 1970 is one of those moments in US and world history where as we're gonna discuss this evening, the idea of the state oppressing its people was a very real reality and a very real concern for those living in the United States and elsewhere. And very briefly, before I turn the floor over to uh, Bill Fletcher Jr., I do want to show something, a, a primary source from 1970. This is from Ebony Magazine, June of that year, their story about the Jackson State shooting. And as you can see here, um, the title page, it says Law and Disorder. It says, the night before, the picture on the opposite page, which we'll see in a second, was taken. This young co-ed at Jackson State College in Jackson, Mississippi, could have been killed for no more of a crime than what she is doing in the photograph. Looking out the window of a room in Alexander Hall, a girl's dorm at the Black School. The broken glass, the numerous holes in the wall, the torn curtains are the result of a 30-second barrage of bullets fired by Mississippi State troopers on a warm spring night during the height of what, in these days of campus unrest, was really a small demonstration. When the troopers ceased firing, two young men were dead and at least nine persons have been wounded. Philip L. Gibbs, 21, a college junior, and James L. Green, 17, a high school senior, were killed as the troops fired into the crowd and raked every floor of the five-story dormitory with bullets. And this is on the other page they're talking about here. This campus of Jackson State uh, the day after the shooting, May 15th, 1970. And if you read the article, I'll put a link to it in the chat and make sure it gets sent out via email as well. The article also makes mention, of course, of the Orangeburg Massacre in 1968. Uh, have a Sunday session about this coming Sunday. But I thought this was a good way to really start tonight's conversation with Bill Fletcher, uh, who, as I mentioned before, is a noted activist, a noted scholar of labor organizing. He is the author of several books. Uh, he has a novel that had just come out as well, um, which I hope we'll talk about this evening too. But Bill Fletcher is really a giant, a champion of freedom and democracy in this country. And he's here tonight to talk a bit about the kinds of forces arrayed against men and women in this country who are fighting for justice and self-determination for all. Ladies and gentlemen, I am honored and thrilled to present to you this evening, Bill Fletcher Jr. Thank you, thank you, Professor Green. Um, and I wanna thank, uh, thank uh, Brett Bercy for inviting me. Uh, I'm gonna apologize in advance. I, um, three weeks ago today, I got COVID. And um, I don't know how many of you have experienced COVID. Uh, I uh, got it in February, 2020. 
when I came back from Africa. And it was before we knew how bad it was gonna be. Um, and then, but we, you know, we've been very taking uh, care of ourselves, vaccinations and wearing masks and everything. And I went to Los Angeles with my wife. And as you know, there's no pandemic in California. And the way I knew that is that nobody was wearing a mask anywhere. And uh, flew back and uh, a few days later came down with it. Um, and I was able to travel about 10 days later, but one of the things about this variant appears is that it doesn't quite go away very quickly. And um, a combination of the COVID and seasonal allergies, and it has me kind of going up and down. So I just want to apologize in advance. Um, I want to begin by asking a question. And I want you, um, if you're on, uh, if you're on Zoom, if you put, could uh, just indicate in the chat that you want to say something, if you're in the room, if uh, Dr. Green can just uh, call on you. Um, I want to ask the question, why do the police and National Guard exist? What's the origin of both of them? Who wants to start? Go ahead, Sarah, please. Slave patrol for the police. Mm -hmm. And uh, the National Guard, I don't know. It's the uh, governor's army. I mean, the governor's the, you know, posse comatatus, whatever the charge of the national. I don't know. Okay. Anyone else? Thank you on that. Randall, go ahead, please. I would like to say after living in uh, South Carolina since 2007, that one of the, or two of the origins of militias comes out of our colonial history, but also like the Citadel and like uh, other institutions like the State Guard, which still exists, it was started out as a slave patrol, which was the thing that they had that white plantation owners organized and funded in case there was a slave revolt. Okay. So you both have part of the answer. Um, the origin of police is in part about slave patrols, but also in part related to suppressing worker uprisings, particularly in cities. Um, and, and what's interesting about it is that we think about the police primarily in terms of fighting crime, but that was like almost like a third angle with the issue of slave patrols and suppressing workers being principal thing. The National Guard has its origin in state militias. And this becomes very relevant to the Second Amendment. Because if you read the Second Amendment, the Second Amendment grammatically is written in a very peculiar way um, because it talks about the right to bear arms, but it, it does that in direct connection to the creation of militias and as opposed to individual rights. Now, the thing about militias is that militias were formed for two principal reasons. One that was just mentioned, to go up against slaves, but the other was to go up against the indigenous. It was part of the efforts by the settler colonial state to develop localized armies that could go off against Native Americans. And, and in that context, the arming of the white population became very important so that there becomes a relationship between guns and being white. That is, if you were white, you could own guns and use them. 
And <clears throat> if you had a gun and you were not white, that puts you in real danger. So gun ownership and being white becomes um, uh, almost synonymous, which is one of the reasons that in the United States, it is such an emotional issue. Gun ownership is very substantial in places like Sweden, but it doesn't play the same role that it does in the United States. The emotional attachment to gun ownership is directly related to the racial settler colonial origins of the United States. And, and so therefore, the, the part of what happened was that gun ownership becomes a ticket or a proof of being white, which then raises the next question I want to ask you. Who was being protected by both the police and the militias? Who was it that was creating this? So we're hearing some answers in the room. We're hearing uh, white people, white women, capitalists. Anybody else want to chime in? Wealthy people. Wealthy people. Wasn't us. <laughs> Wasn't us. <laughs> so let's let's focus on that, right? So wealthy people organized through a state, right? Um, needed a mechanism in order to enforce or reinforce their ability to dominate. Now, there's two different ways of, that domination takes place. One is through the instruments of repression, which we're going to talk about today, uh, which includes legal, extra-legal, and ideological. But then there's also um, other forms of domination. That is the notion of social control. That is the ability of those in power to convince a substantial part of the population that they have more um, in, uh, in common with those at the top than they do with others in their same class category, if there is a way that the people at the top are able to distinguish, and, and the way that they're able to do this, principally in the, the history of the United States, was through the creation of race and racism. That is by creating these categories that have no scientific basis, specifically the idea of black, white, and red, red meaning uh, the indigenous. And what's, what's interesting, and this goes a, a, a bit far from what I was going to talk about, but I'm going to mention it, is that when you look at the historical record, white is not referenced in connection with Europeans until the late 1600s. And when you look at, in terms of the, uh, the colonial America, and that is directly related to the, the slow gelling of a colonial ruling class, a colonial state that ultimately needs a mechanism in addition to active repression in order to, in order to ensure domination. Because it's in the 1600s that people at the bottom, plus the indigenous, are revolting or at war with the people at the top. The non-indigenous, the indentured servants and the slaves, and many of the Africans were first indentured servants. Um, they were you know, sometimes by themselves or sometimes jointly revolting against the colonial elite. And the colonial elite, who were small in number, had to figure out a way to ensure supremacy, and they weren't going to be able to do it by guns alone. And it's through the creation of a system, a structure of racism, not just an idea, a structure, that they're able to uh, reinforce their domination. Now, in looking at repression, I mentioned that there's legal, extra legal, and there's ideological. And, um, and so what, what you start to see as a state structure emerges is that the legal arm 
is through things like the police and the state militias, and eventually the state militias are rechristened a National Guard. Um, I, uh, I grew up in New York, and in Manhattan, the borough of Manhattan, there are these beautiful buildings, these armories that look like little castles, and you could see them uh, in um, lower and midtown Manhattan. And I, um, I always wondered about these armories uh, and why, why did they exist? I thought that they were just sort of almost like ornamental, only to find out later that they were created in the 19th century when the capitalists and the government were deeply worried about worker uprisings. And they created these armories so that the state militia that then becomes the National Guard would have weapons and ammunition in order to crush any revolts that workers carried out. And particularly after the 1877 strikes, when there were these, these uh, went from one state to another, there was a deep worry about a workers' uprising. And so the legal instrument ends up becoming the police and, and, the, and the National Guard. But there's also extra legal forms of repression. So extra legal includes terrorist groups, lynchings, et cetera, that are done frequently with the, uh, uh, the government turning a blind eye or in some cases actively supporting it. So the undermining of reconstruction in the South is largely done through extra legal means from during the reconstruction period where you had terrorist groups like the original KKK, the Knights of the White Camellia and others that carry out activities. Now, initially, these groups get repressed. And as a side note, the US Secret Service um, was actually very successful and was deployed against many of these white terrorist groups. Um, and, and they suppressed them. The problem, however, was that the, the, the suppression of these terrorist groups was not followed through upon. And so as Reconstruction was coming to an end, these white terrorist groups reemerge and the governments in the South are starting to weaken and there's little support from the federal government and Reconstruction gets overthrown. So, so repression can take the, the legal form and the extra legal form. And one of the things about the extra legal form that you saw in Reconstruction South is that the white terrorist groups uh, often first targeted white people. They went after white supporters of Reconstruction in order to teach white people that they should not align themselves with Black folks and that they would pay a price for being an end lover. All right. And, and so you have these extra legal means. But then there's the ideological. And, and I wanted to mention this before just talking a little bit about uh, some examples of the, um, of, of the significance of repression. In the very beginning of the book, The State and Revolution by Lenin, uh, there's a very interesting reference that he makes to how a ruling class will uh, attack, demonize, terrorize those who are advocates for the oppressed, but that upon the death of these same advocates, the ruling class will often take them, take their memory and twist their memory and, and make them and their image something that is more acceptable to the objectives of the ruling class. And, and it's, this is a profound ideological instrument of repression. Uh, 
the, fable, uh, the, the, the very famous fabulist, Asa, uh, who is often described as Greek, but he was actually either from Turkey or Africa, had a story that summed it up when he talked about the man and the lion. You may have heard of this story. And the idea was that once upon a time, a man and a lion are walking through the jungle. They come across each other and they decide to walk together and the lion could talk. So everything is fine. They're chatting. And then they get into this argument about who's superior, humans or lions. And they come across a clearing. And in the clearing, there is a statue of this man, this, uh, of Hercules standing on top of a lion. And so the man says to the lion, he says, that proves it. The lion says, what does that prove? And the man says, that proves that humans are superior to lions. And the lion says, yes, but if it had been a lion that had built the statue, it would be the lion standing on top of Hercules. And that's the basic idea we've got to understand about the ideological element of repression, that the dominant forces will frequently rewrite history or, or, or cleanse history of things that they do not want addressed. We see that right now in many states, including Florida uh, and Texas and other places where there's this, a move against so-called critical race theory, which is actually not about critical race theory because most of these Republicans that are talking about it couldn't spell critical race theory if you put the letters in front of them. But what they're doing is that they're moving against the truth. They're basically saying that there's certain things that they do not want discussed about history. And so part of repression is eliminating things. One, uh, one example of that was why did W.E.B. Du Bois write the book Black Reconstruction in America in 1935? And the reason is that for decades after the defeat of Reconstruction, there was an orchestrated effort to redefine Reconstruction and to change what Reconstruction was actually about or had been about and to defame it. Um, and, and so uh, when the film Birth of a Nation was produced in, uh, in 1915, based on a book called The Klansman, the, I, the, the, the central thesis of the film was that during Reconstruction, Black folks had run wild. And, you know, Black, uh, black uh, folks were corrupt. They were being uh, supported by corrupt white people from the North. And uh, Black men were, of course, chasing white women and were eating watermelon and chicken in state legislatures. And everything went to hell and that the KKK was formed as a response to this corruption and that they saved the South. Woodrow Wilson showed this film in the White House. And, and in many respects, the basic thesis of this film became the dominant narrative as to what happened in Reconstruction. And, with, and Du Bois wrote a response demolishing that entire uh, uh, narrative and, and, and recasting Reconstruction as it absolutely and actually was. But this ideological component becomes very important because people grew up believing this. I'll give you another example that's closer to home. In 1934, there was the great textile strike, most of which was in the South. And South Carolina, Tennessee, and North Carolina were central to this strike. Now, how many of you knew the concentration camps were created in the context of this strike? I'm just curious. You can either show a hand or put something in the, in the chat. How many of you were aware of that? OK. And there's a reason for that. So let me just say what happened. So the strike was massive. And the state militias were called out and so-called detention camps were set up where strikers and their families were in prison, 
with the support of the state government. The strike was unsuccessful, in part because of that. And in part because Roosevelt, Fra Franklin Roosevelt at the time, would not come down on these state governments with uh, a kaboom, which is what should have happened. Now, that wasn't enough. What becomes critical is that the story of 1934 ends up being recast. There's a great film, The Uprising of 34, uh, a woman named Judith Helfen made it to try to tell the real story. It came out in 1995. I think some of you may have seen it. And, and to tell the real story of what happened. But the bottom line and what is really remarkable is that many average South Carolinians and probably and people in other states, the narrative that they articulated was that the union had created the problem. That's what people say. The union was the problem. And that if it hadn't been for the union, none of that would have happened. So in other words, the fact that people were repressed, put in detention camps, their lives were often destroyed, was recast by the ruling elites in the South as the union had created the problem. And regular people started repeating this. And because the real history was not being told, that's what people ended up believing. Dr. Green, how much time do I have? Oh, you have uh, plenty of time. It's only about seven o'clock. So uh, we have plenty of time for Q&A whenever you're ready, but uh, okay. you have some time. Go ahead, please. All right, thank you. Um, so, the, so, so I want you to keep that in mind about repression that it's not just what the government does in the form of uh, the Jackson State murders or the Kent State murders. Um, it, is, it can be the, that role, including things like COINTELPRO, the counterintelligence program that was used to disrupt uh, the Communist Party, used to disrupt the Black Freedom Movement, the American uh, Indian Movement, Asian Americans, the Peace Movement, et cetera. That's the kind of, the, the, role, the active role of the state. But it can be extra legal. KKK, the Minutemen, uh, now we have the Proud Boys, we have um, the Oath Keepers. There are extra legal mechanisms, and some of which engage in active violence, and some of which imply violence. Violence does not always have to be used directly, it can be implied. And then you have the repression from it, through ideology where history is retold, and basically people, are, uh, uh, the argument is, you do something, you're gonna get whacked, uh, pure and simple. Um, so the, um, so that, that's one part of what I wanted to raise. Now, the other part is about the challenge that all of this raises to social justice movements. And, um, and, and the, the problem is that when you read the Constitution <clears throat> and when you embrace the myth of US history, you want to believe that we live in a democratic, small d, country. And one of the ways to understand US history and, and democracy in the US is by analogy. Uh, Mahatma Gandhi from India was once interviewed and he was asked, what did he think of Western civilization? And he got quiet for a minute and was thinking about I'm it. Not. I'm sorry. So, um, and, and he was, was, it, he was, he got quiet. And then he said, I think it would be a good idea. Um, that's one way to understand democracy in the United States, that we've grown up on, on this myth that we live in a democratic, small d country. But democracy would be a good idea in the United States. But what you see time and again is that when there is massive dissent, particularly dissent that crosses racial lines, but not only, but the sense that challenges 
the structure of the country and particularly issues of white supremacy and male supremacy and class privilege, that there is a response that is immediate and not subtle. Um, and, and we see that throughout US history, whether you're talking about the, the, the invasion and the acquisition of the lands of the uh, Native Americans and the, res and the responses to their resistance, whether you talk about reconstruction, or when you talk about trade unions, the US has the most violent history in the advanced capitalist world when it comes to labor capital relations. Why? Because capital is incredibly repressive anytime workers get organized. The repression can be through laws, or for example, in 1910, 1912, there was major organizing of workers in Louisiana. Uh, there was a strike led by the Brotherhood of Timber Workers, and the state militia came out with field artillery and machine guns. Uh, and that was how they responded to a strike. So, so we got to understand this is the way that the largest structure can uh, frequently respond, not always, but can frequently. Now, this leads the oppressed uh, to uh, develop multiple strategies and conclusions about how to respond to or how to uh, carry out struggles for social change. And if you take the, uh, the case of the Black Freedom Movement, what's often referred to as the Civil Rights Movement, there were deep divisions that sometimes are personalized. You know, like Martin Luther King was this, Malcolm X was that or whatever. And, and don't get to the, the way that different forces were understanding what it was that they were up against and trying to figure out how best to prosecute a struggle. Um, and, and so, for example, the, the issue of um, like Medgar Evers return from World War II had been trained as a soldier, was furious about the condition of black folks in the South and was actually contemplating the notion of beginning guerrilla warfare in the South against the Jim Crow regimes. Most people don't know that because we know him as a civil rights activist. Part of the conclusion for Medgar Evers and a number of other people is we don't have the numbers. Um, and it was pure and simple. And, and, that, and, and that there needed to be a different view of strategy it wasn't necessarily because people embraced some sort of moralistic attachment to nonviolence, but it was looking at the nature of the opposition and trying to figure out, in effect, how to build a majoritarian movement. And this is the way I think we have to understand Dr. King. That yes, Dr. King believed in nonviolence. Dr. King was committed to a sort of Gandhian approach. But Dr. King also could count. And that is, he looked at and understood the nature of the United States, understood that African-Americans were and continue to be a minority. And within that context, was trying to figure out how do we build a majoritarian movement that is for civil rights, but then ultimately, for human rights, ultimately for economic justice. So he, his notion was not just this moralistic thing, which is part of what the US state likes to lead us to believe, you know, this whole thing that people like DeSantis and others will do every January 15th by, you know, basically, you know, taking the end of King's um, uh, I Have a Dream speech <clears throat> and focusing on this idea of, you know, someday all these children are going to look at each other and embrace each other, um, as opposed to understanding that he was talking about the fundamental transformation 
of the United States away from being a white supremacist uh, state, away from being a globally unjust state, away from being an economically unjust state. Um, and so within the freedom movement, there were these debates about what to do. Now, the larger forces arrayed against us understood this. And so they deployed these three mechanisms that I mentioned, legal repression, extra legal repression, and ideological repression. And the other thing was co-optation, um, which I didn't mention. And the co-optation, of course, was were you buying people off or giving people jobs or convincing people that, um, that there is another approach and that it's better if you don't resist, we'll find a place for you within the larger system. And this happens in any, uh, whenever the, the masses of people are rising up against oppression, there's always an attempt by the ruling group to engage in co-optation. You saw it in South Africa in the fight against apartheid when they reached out to Butalezi, uh, 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 you know, or when they did other kinds of co-optation. And in the United States, you had that too. Um, and you had the, the act of legal repression, what happened in Birmingham, uh, you know, with, with the protesters, extra legal repression, the assassination of King, uh, the assassination of Malcolm X, Medgar Evers, um, you know, uh, the, the kind of racial terror. But then you also have the ideological repression, and particularly after 68 and after 70 or 72, you start to see the transformation of our history. King becomes a postage stamp. <clears throat> um, the Malcolm X, who no, none of us would have ever thought would have become a postage stamp, becomes a postage stamp. And they make a great movie about Malcolm X, right? Except it turns out that there was a lot of it that was inaccurate. Um, it, but there's a certain kind of legitimacy that ends up becoming part of the issue of repression that's used against us. All right, so let me stop in one second by summarizing a, a couple of points and just suggestions. Um, what does this mean then that we do? Because the forces are arrayed against us. So let's keep a few things in mind. We will never have the level of resources that the oppressor does. In fact, if you look at history, the oppressed never have the resources that the oppressor does. I mean, Jesus did not have the level of resources that the Romans or the Hebrew establishment had, right? I mean, it's just like, it, it, it's sort of counterintuitive. So we should eliminate the whole notion of, oh, damn, we're not going to be able to win because we'll never have Fox News. We, we, need, Fox, we need something that's as strong as Fox News. You know, what, well, like, get over it? Really? We're not, it's not going to happen. We are in an asymmetric situation. The oppressed always are until we win, which means that our strategies cannot be the strategies of the oppressor. They have to be based on a completely different set of assumptions. And that is that we have to constantly be thinking about how do we build a majoritarian movement that changes the overall narrative and splits our opponents so that we can win. A second thing, we should learn, you don't beat your drums before you go hunting tigers. That we don't have to announce everything that we're gonna do to defend ourselves. Uh, one of the big mistakes in the 1960s and early 70s is that many very courageous people would announce publicly all of the things that they were going to do. And that played into the hands of our opponents. You don't need to announce things. There's things as they would just say that get done. And, and that's the other part of opposing repression. You just don't need to talk about a lot of stuff. It just gets done. Um, 
the, uh, uh, the, the, the third thing I mentioned in passing, you have to divide your opponent. If you look at what's happening right now in the Sudan, there was a massive public uprising against the dictatorship of al-Bashir uh, a few years ago. And the military realized at a certain point that there was no percentage in them sticking with al-Bashir. So they turned against them. And there was a sort of coalition with civilian forces and the military. The problem was that the military was insufficiently divided so that the progressive civilian forces were only, be able, were only able to go but so far because the, the, estab the state, the, the, the dominant forces still had the military and the paramilitaries under, under their control. And the civilian forces did not have the resources right now to take on uh, the, the military. You have to be able to divide your opponents. When you're able to divide your opponents, you're in a better position to win. As I like to say, um, the oppressed never need more enemies than they can take down at one moment. That means that we've got to be very tactical in taking on our opponents. Um, there are many people out there that we don't like. There are many people that we don't trust. We don't need to treat all of them as enemies at once. To do so strengthens their hand and weakens ours. Um, and, and so I think I'm going to stop there and open it up for discussions, questions, disagreements, however you'd like to proceed. Dr. Green, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much. Fantastic. Let's give them a round of applause first. That was, that was wonderful. A lot of to think about there. Uh, number one, before we get to Q and A, uh, uh, Mr. Fletcher, I want to commend you on your your Klingon coffee cup. I just happened to notice that, so I had to commend you on that as a fellow Trek fan. Um, but we do want to open for um, for questions. Um, I see Randall has his hand up, so go ahead, Randall. And you go ahead and unmute yourself, please. Yes, it's such a simple task. Um, as soon as you said that, Mr. Fletcher, I was reminded that I had engaged with the progressive um, confab within the Democratic Party in South Carolina for a little bit, and I finally had to sort of cast them aside because they had no concept of what you just pointed out, which is not going explicitly to the punchline uh, and expect success. And I don't know how many people get involved in state and local politics in this class, but that that is such a profound concept that I'm just uh, sort of overwhelmed to hear you say it. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, I, I wanna just sort of respond uh, to a couple of things. One that's implied in what you said. Um, I claim Klingon ancestry. And, <laughs> um, and one of the things that Klingons have asserted that's very relevant to this class is revenge is a dish best served cold. <laughs> um, and, and that's something that we need to understand. Uh, you don't need to telegraph everything. Um, and the second related to that is someone mentioned Sun Tzu. Um, I strongly recommend that anyone serious about struggle reads Sun Tzu, The Art of War, because it's not simply about military conflict. <clears throat> it's about strategy and tactics. And, um, and, and in reading Sun Tzu, uh, it's, it's really, it's very profound. And one of his statements 
Uh, know your enemy and know yourself and you can fight 100 battles without fear of defeat uh, is something that many progressives don't get because we usually don't really understand ourselves and we definitely don't understand our enemy. And, and we therefore can't develop reasonable strategies. And in, in a, and taking on our opponents, you've got to really understand. I'll give you an example. We often identify the political right as monolithic. They're not. Um, the political right is as divided as the left. Um, they they just handle their differences their diff their differences uh, very differently than we do. Um, but you know you have within the political right fascists and you have people like um, Cheney, right? Um, you know the congresswoman, you know who had who was, was furious about uh, about uh, Trump and about January sixth. That doesn't mean that Liz Cheney is an uh, is a strategic ally of ours, but it means under very specific circumstances. She is a tactical ally. Now, for many progressives, that is just inconceivable. How can you possibly say this? Again, it goes back to you take on as many enemies as you can take down at one moment. And when you try to take down too many, you're cruising for a bruiser. Now, I think within that, um, I actually want to, I have a question I actually want to pose. Um, in preparing for tonight's class, um, I read a few of Bill Fletcher's um, blog posts from his website, and one that stood out to me was your piece from 2020 um, about the idea of how organized labor should deal with what you refer to as a cold civil war. Um, could you talk a bit about that cold civil war concept? Because I think it's important to getting a sense of what polarization, politically speaking, looks like in the here and now. Thank you. So I talk about, I, I borrowed the term Cold Civil War from someone I can't remember who it was. I stumbled across it in an article. And I thought that that was a very good way to describe the political moment that we're in. Um, and that it's a better notion than polarization. Why? Because we've been polarized throughout US history. Polarization is nothing new. Uh, in, in the US War of Independence, contrary to the myths that many of us grew up on, uh, only one third of the population supported independence. Uh, one third supported the British and the middle third wasn't really sure. So the battle of the War of Independence was around the middle group and winning them over. Um, that polarization was very, very deep. Um, we had something in the United States that was called the Civil War, uh, which many of you probably heard about. And I I'd say, you know, that was pretty exemplary of a polarization. Um, so, so we've been polarized th throughout U.S. history. In 1934, there was a plot to overthrow Franklin Roosevelt. Um, I'm just curious, how many people knew about this? I've heard of that. Yeah. Okay. So it was, um, there was a group called the Liberty League, which was these corporate right wingers that asked a uh, retired Marine Corps general named Smedley Butler, you can look this up, Absolutely. if he would lead a march on Washington uh, that was going to be uh, 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 modeled off of Mussolini's March on Rome. In 1922, um, and with the idea of, of either overthrowing Roosevelt or forcing Roosevelt to bring Butler on as a, a special advisor who would have all kinds of authority. And Butler said he wasn't going for this, uh, denounced it, went public, and but the US ruling group, ruling elite was so afraid of this that they tried to turn Butler into, uh, make him out to be uh, an idiot, uh, a fool who would uh, you know, just kind of came, come up with this. So there's been polarization. In 1940, there was a plot uh, that involved several US congressmen 
and the Nazis to overthrow Roosevelt. So we've been polarized. The Cold Civil War notion is that there are forces arrayed that are that have decided that constitutional democracy no longer works and that their differences are no longer about who can win through the basic instruments of democratic capitalism. But it's more akin to what happened <clears throat> in the South with the, at the end of Reconstruction. That is the, the, the need to overthrow constitutional democracy without necessarily looking like you've ended it. And so you have these forces that essentially want to return the United States to roughly 1898, and, and they want to overthrow the 20th century. So we're not just talking about a political de debate between liberals and conservatives, between radicals and conservatives or whatever. We're talking about something very different. Um, and the right wing, which is, as I mentioned, is not monolithic, but is becoming much more consolidated around the notion of dictatorship. So the Republican Party has now become the party for dictatorship. And we know that because you see the different instruments that they are prepared to employ, not just gerrymandering, uh, but gerrymandering, other kinds of voter suppression, um, turning a blind eye to naked uh, insurrection, the coup attempt of January 6th, and, uh, uh, and other such things. So they're prepared to go along with extra legal mechanisms to, in order to gain power. Now, one of the things about the right, and you saw this in Germany and in Italy before, uh, when it, uh, before the fascists took over, is that there's, a, there's often a segment of the right that believes that the fascists can be controlled. Um, and that, that, you know, the fascists are kind of loony, but we can basically bring them in. Now, one of the things about this particular moment is that the capitalists largely are not in favor of eliminating constitutional democracy entirely, but there is a segment of the capitalist class that is. And that's particularly, you can find it in the fossil fuel industry and in segments of real estate and finance where they are prepared to entertain the notion of eliminating or significantly modifying constitutional democracy. <clears throat> Excuse me, so that we could have a form of, well, you could have a state like uh, in Russia, the Putin regime, is a semi-fascist state. Um, it has all of the window dressing of democracy, that is that they continue to have elections, but the elections mean less and less because people can't fairly compete. When people uh, come forward, they are repressed, they are killed, or they are jailed. Um, and so you have the outer appearance of democracy, but you actually don't have the ability to compete. So that's what I mean by a cold civil war. There are elements of the right that want to make that cold civil war hot. And so every so often you'll see uh, these, these um, uh, extremist activities uh, like recent murders where you'll, where you'll have provocateurs uh, that want to incite a race war of some sort. That's the way that the right envisions the civil war actually playing out as a race war. Uh, and they're very well armed, very well armed. And I don't mean just with shotguns. Uh, so they take this very seriously. Uh, that's, that's a great answer. And I think that's a really important thing for the class to consider because 
while the Modesto Simpkins School of Human Rights is a lot about the history of South Carolina from a bottom-up perspective, I think keeping in mind the context of what folks were pushing back against in the past gives us some sense of what we're looking at in the here and now. So I think that, again, that analysis is really, really important. Um, any questions at all? Any more questions for Mr. Fletcher? This is a great conversation. Go ahead, please. Sure, uh, thank you. Um, and wonderful presentation, uh, Mr. Fletcher. I have to say, uh, I'm got one chapter left in your book, Solidarity uh, Divided. It certainly merits a uh, second reading, and I recommend the, the book to, to everyone, Chamber History and, and, uh, and Strategy. But for the class today, I recall that maybe it was built um, about the relationship or the dialectic, if you will, between uh, radical and revolutionary struggle and, and uh, what we might call um, liberal conception of, of, of progress in this society. But as we know that as long as we remain within the bounds of, of this system, that all the rights that we have fought for and won from voting rights to abortion rights, um, they, they are at risk of being overturned and rolled back. So my question for you is, um, how do we avoid in the midst of this struggle, um, which is a long term a struggle, how do we avoid slipping into the danger of romanticizing struggle for struggle's sake and losing sight of, of the ultimate goal, uh, the big prize, if you will, which is namely the, the fundamental transformation of, of this society, as you mentioned earlier, uh, namely blowing away with its uh, white supremacist uh, nature and, and capitalist foundation? That's a great question. So first, um, I should have said this earlier, please call me Bill. Um, Mr. Fletcher was my father. And okay. uh, I appreciate, but I, I appreciate the respect. So I want to thank you for that. Uh, you and, and Dr. Green. Um, your question is so critical because it forces us to rethink certain things, including the way we would like things to be. There's, there's a, and it also helps us to understand what happened between roughly 1968 and 73. Um, there's a very famous quote from Dr. King, where he said, the arc of history is long, but it bends towards justice. Now, most of us have heard that. It's a beautiful quote. There's only one problem. It's wrong. Um, and, and it's wrong because um, he, <clears throat> what he's right about is that the arc of history is long. What he's wrong about is that it doesn't necessarily bend towards justice. It bends all kinds of ways. I mean, when the Mongols destroyed Baghdad, they destroyed so many advances in the history of humankind. It's unbelievable. Um, and set back humanity in terms of philosophy, science. I mean, you, you can't like look at the history of the world and just say that there's a steady line towards progress. What you see is that it's up and down, sometimes great reversals, sometimes magnificent jumps forward, right? And, and the role of human agency, that is humans deciding and taking steps, sometimes in the face of projected defeat, is all that we can do. Uh, and so one of the mistakes in the late 60s was that particularly after the death of King, there was a great division, certainly in the Black Freedom Movement, about the next steps. King had basically been saying after 66, it wasn't enough to talk about civil rights, we had to talk about essentially what we call now global justice and economic justice. Um, but there were elements in the Black Freedom Movement that said, not so fast. 
we're actually doing pretty well because as a result of all of these victories, you started to see the rise of a larger black professional managerial class. More folks were going to college, more business ventures. When uh, many people forget that when Nixon was elected uh, in 1968, even though he was the, uh, the orator of the Southern strategy, which is really the white people's strategy, uh, that is to win whites away from the Democratic Party, he also had another strategy, which was black capitalism. And the whole notion that there was a place in the Republican Party for black folks. And there was a place in the capitalist system for black folks. You, you know, it's easy to forget this, particularly when we're looking at today's Republican Party, that there was an active outreach to black folks to win them, and it was relatively successful. Um, so there were these divisions. But the other thing that was going on that was related was that there were many people that basically felt that history could not go backwards. That, and this was not just true of the Black Freedom Movement. In the women's movement, the victory that was represented by the Supreme Court decision in Roe v. Wade, people were led to believe that it just simply couldn't get reversed, that there could be all kinds of decisions that might narrow it, but that it would never be reversed. And as a result, there was bad strategy because instead of fighting it out in state legislatures, both to get the Equal Rights Amendment passed, but also to ensure that in state law and state constitutions, the right of women to control their own bodies was codified, the fight was restricted to the courts. This court battle, that court battle, blah, da, 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 da. Whereas the right wing was saying, well, we'll do the court battle, but you know what? We're gonna kick your ass at the state legislative level. And that is what they did. And so all of a sudden, we woke up and said, oh my God, what's happened in these state legislatures? But by that point, it was too late. We, we were gonna need, and do need now, completely different strat strategy at the state level. Um, it's not impossible, because I'm convinced we can win, but we have to think very, very differently. Um, and so, so that's one part of the answer to your question. Second part is organization. That without organ, that, that the only the only weapon we have as people as the oppressed is organization. We don't have money. We don't have radio stations. There's no invisible country sitting in the Atlantic that's going to provide us with gold. It ain't going to happen. We, all we got is organization, and so and that's what the oppressor understands. That's why they're always destroying our organizations, including by infiltrating, repressing creating divisions um, and, 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 and other such things. So we have to build organization and we have to build and preserve organization, which also means uh, we need strategy and theory. Going back to your point about fundamental transformation, we can't lose sight of that, but we have to have strategies that ultimately get us there, but begin with understanding the current situation not strategies that are based on some sort of how the hell do we get to utopia, right? It's sort of like, if you want to get to Mars, you got to get to the moon first. You don't start by saying, we're going to Mars. You may say that ultimately we're going to Mars or ultimately we're going to Saturn, but you can't ignore the moon. If the moon is not there, you ain't getting to Mars. And that's part of the problem with a lot of progressives. We have these pie in the sky ideas about, you know, like we're gonna be, we're gonna get to socialism here. And, be, and it's like, wait a minute, right now we're fighting the neo-confederacy. What is our strategy against the neo-confederacy? How do we fight to get progressive power in South Carolina? So let me, let me just say something about, about South Carolina. Um, and then uh, uh, and relates to your, your point, and then I'm going to shut up. 
Um, so it's not just South Carolina. A few years ago, about 10 years ago, I was in Texas. I was invited to give a talk. And I, you know, after the talk, there was Q&A. And so one person after another saying, Bill, and they're telling me how bad the situation was in Texas. And this is before Abbott, right? And just, oh my God, this and that, and this and that. And then they get silent. They want to know, what, what do I have to say? What's the words of encouragement? And I looked at them and I said, how do we take over Texas? Now, at that point, they must have thought that before I came into the conference, that I had been smoking some herb <laughs> and that it had just hit my head, right? And, and, you know, and I said, no, seriously, how do we take over Texas? I mean, you've told me how bad it is. I get it. I know, I know it's bad. But the question is, how do we win? If our objective is not to win, then we should just get a lot of herb, get as high as we can, and give up. And if that's not the right alternative, then how do we put the pieces together to take over Texas? So I said, I'll tell you what I mean. Which are the key cities that we need to win in Texas? Which are the key counties? Which counties can we ignore? Which are the key social movements? Who are the key opinion makers? What are the most important churches, right? Um, who, what radio stations do we need? And, you know, in order to win. I said, that's the elements of putting a strategy together. It's not just defending yourself against the enemy. Anyone, any boxer will tell you, you stay in the defensive, no matter how strong you are, you're going to lose. How do you take on your opponent? A couple of years ago, I was asked the same question by some people in Florida, some young activists. Oh, they would tell me how bad the situation was in Florida. Oh my God, it was the sand distance, this and that. So I said, okay, I got it. So how do we take over Florida? Well, again, they thought I had been smoking dope, right? And I said, no, I said, let's, I said, do the numbers. Go through the counties and start thinking about it. And all of a sudden, they started getting excited. I've been saying the same thing about South Carolina. How do we take over South Carolina? I'm not interested in hearing anymore about how bad South Carolina is. My attitude is what Malcolm X said about the South. When he was told, you know, he was asked about, you know, how bad the South was. He said, the South is anything south of the Canadian border. That's my attitude, right? It's like, yeah, I know it's bad. So how do we take over South Carolina? You know, I remember when someone told me in 2012 that Obama got 40% of the vote in South Carolina without the Democratic Party spending a dime in the state. I said, 40% of the vote and not a dime was spent? 40%. That ain't very far from 50%. So therefore, what do we need to do? And that's strategy. Go look at the map and figure out how are we going to take the big boy down? And that, to answer your question, is how we go forward. And that's what keeps us going, keeps us motivated, knowing that at this point, the enemy is stronger. The enemy is actually smarter than we are, right? But the enemy has many, many weaknesses and they display themselves at different points. One of the reasons that the Republicans are trying to change state law where you have state referendums is because they understand better than progressives that more and more women and their allies are saying, uh-uh, we're not going to have these restrictions on the right to control our bodies. And so they're, they're changing to try to elevate so that state, uh, state referendums or initiatives, ballot initiatives, now need 60% of the vote. Let's get ahead of the curve. 
Let's also start thinking about how do we muck around with the other side. I am very mischievous. Anyone knows me. My wife tells me that she fell in love with me because she, found, she finally realized how mischievous I was. And I introduced mischievousness into strategy. How do we disrupt the other side? You know, you know, like, I, I, I don't think you can, I don't know whether you can do ballot initiatives in South Carolina, but there's probably ways that you can introduce various pieces of legislation at the state level, county level, city level, that may get smacked down, but will disrupt the other side and create fear in the hearts of the other side. And that's when we know that we've won. So all that, that's a very long answer to your question. That was a great question, well, a great answer. Go ahead. Thanks. Any other questions? Brett, did you have anything to add to that? Because I know you've talked a lot about strategy here in South Carolina in particular. Yeah, I do. And um, Bill Fletcher is um, a great teacher and, and has been... Um, should have been a student in the Majeska School, would have heard us talking about the, <clears throat> the utilization of the uh, local initiatives to be able to change state law. Or that we ha have to be real careful about drawing and when we draw it, because it'll change the damn law. And so that's, you know, that's part of that long strategy game that we got to have. But I, I wanted to lift up the other, and Bill, thank you for coming. Uh, you are a difficult act to follow, and I'm proud to try and do it. But um, the things I wanted to mention and told people we're going to talk about a little bit is about we've seen this wave of oppression being repetitive. What were they repetitive about? What were they reacting to? So let's look at that. And as we look at, say, the uh, when the Wobblies got smashed and, and we led up to the 1919 Palmer raids and the first Red Scare that we've studied about, that was because they, they were multiracial. They were cross trade. They wanted one big union, not skilled unions and craft unions and labor unions. They had women and they had men. That's what got smashed. You know, fast forward to the Southern Negro Youth Congress, in 1931 to 1948, the Columbia event. They had 171 white delegates in a room. There weren't supposed to be white people. And that the, um, du you know, Du Bois said in Columbia, South Carolina, speech, which I trust all of you haven't, if you haven't read it, you will read the whole, man. he said the South is the firing line, the firing line of change. It, when the black and white workers in the South get together and, and they recognize that, that their absence of unity is the biggest impediment, the bad people realize that that unity is their biggest threat. And so when I'm talking about this repression, let's just when the feds mobilize, because there's all kind of goon squads, corporate goon squads, state thugs, and whatnot. But when you look at these red scares, the one in 19, the first one in 1919, the second one after World War II, that was the federal government. And what threatens the federal government is that type of unity across race, sex, gender, occupation, and that the um, the, the communists. Y'all have heard me say before. Uh, that Majestic was red baited up and down the East Coast, she said, that when she was asked, are you a communist? Her response was, no, I'm, I'm not. But if they're doing all those good things you said they are, maybe I should be. And so that, that's a trope of like the others. It's like during the Civil War, it wasn't the happy Negroes on a plantation that was taken care of that was causing trouble. It was them outsiders, them scallywags and carpet tigers. Uh, so, you know, when the people were being up, upset and organizing um, labor or blacks in the teens and the 30s and the 40s, they blamed it on the communists coming in and tell them they were being oppressed. And so, you know, you fast forward to the, the um, uh, second Red Scare, and they're, then they started taking on um, Hollywood. And now we're doing the same thing. They're doing the same thing. And so it's, it's, the, it's the teachers now. And so this other is a, a constant tactic 
of blaming the other as opposed to people getting together. And so Bill talked about having to organize and there's a really good example of the Democratic Party being part of the problem. And one of the lessons of Majeska School is we cannot vote our way out of the problems that uses the same tools the system uses to keep the problems going. And so in 2000, Cobb Hunter and Joe Neal and I started the Progressive Caucus of the Democratic Party. We could control the floor. We were the only caucus. The largest constituent group was, was Black women. All the people, there's very few Black women up on the stage. And so that went on until 2014 when we'd embarrassed them so many times by being able to take over the floor of the convention by challenging the chair and overriding the edict of the chair by having 25% of the thousand people in the room stand up. The times we challenged it, nearly everyone stood up. They weren't going to be opposed to the anti-gay marriage amendment. They weren't going to be, a, they didn't come out and support um, the Affordable Care Act because their candidate for governor, Vince Shaheen, said, I can't touch Obamacare because Vince lost to Nikki the first time in 2010 by 4%. And he had to be soft enough, you know, to convince 4% of them Republicans that he was really almost like one of them. So meanwhile, back in reality land, there's 400,000 registered black voters not voting. That's about 47% of the black population in South Carolina. They're not voting because it doesn't do any good. That's what they know in their lives. Their kids under 26 in 2022 out of 123,000 registered black voters, 13% voted. But we have to be talking, this party does is completely contrary to the organ and proves that we'll caucus. There were no caucuses. One caucus, it had the women, the black people, people, everybody in one caucus, labor, called the progressive caucus. Now there's 16 caucuses. <laughs> They're kind of fighting amongst themselves. This is the bylaws, and they said the caucus have um, the, a number of things they had to have, but the main was that the caucuses had to support the platform, which was not much of a problem. So, you know, the Democratic platform is reasonably good, it's idealistic. And we have to support the candidates. The candidates didn't support the platform. So we quit on a matter of principle. So that ground is needing to be tilled again. The Democratic Party has no, no plan, but we have to have an outside game to be able to organize on the inside by expressing the clarity and the need for us to organize outside the system that is used to oppress us. And that's hopefully what the Majestic School is teaching. That's what the Progressive Network has been trying to do. We will continue to try and do it. And I think these, these are the other, what's the, uh, the coin that, that says danger, the other side is opportunity. And this is a tremendous time for us to be able to get people's attention and to be able to organize in a, in a fashion like Mr. Fletcher says, of, of, of having things that resonate with them and to be very strategic about it. We, we, I'm, I'm at a meeting right now with the national, big national funders that are putting money into the states that control Congress and the White House. And they're acting like this is a plan for democracy. Well, see, there, it doesn't work in the, the southern states that, that we're working with, with a foundation I've been on for 20 years now, the Southern Partners Fund. There's 12 southern states in that. Only three of them, the elections count. And so the whole message is every vote counts. Just get, just get people registered and vote. Well, when that doesn't work in your state, that's just not a good message. It doesn't work. And so what we're trying to do is to come up with really sound policies predicated on understanding the problems, coming up with ways that are practical ways to fix them and organizing them. And the, um, the last thing to point out here is that the, the uh, black and white citizens of South Carolina have come together before, but they, the sense of cynicism that it doesn't do any good is exacerbated if you're trying to use the same tools that they became cynical about. That's uh, my couple of cents there. Um, let's see if anybody else it is one of the network activists and members here that has something to say. 
All right. Um, Randall, I see your hand is raised. I have to apologize. I didn't mean to badmouth the Progressive Caucus, uh, Brett, except that um, in, in my interactions with them, I just thought they didn't have a clue as to how to get things done. Um, that may or may not be true. That was just my impression. Over. No, that's that's fine. That's fine. Um, I just want to pick up on something. Um, so we need to win, build a majoritarian movement. Um, I think uh, Brett's point about the way that the system comes down on cross-racial efforts is really important. They don't just come down on cross-racial efforts. Let's be clear that when, when you have the oppressed revolting and fighting, there is repression. But when the oppressed are saying, we're not by ourselves, that's when the system gets really nervous. So there's something called Afro-pessimism. Some of you may have heard of it. Say that again. Afro-pessimism. And it's a, it's a kind of, um, it's something particularly in academia. Um, and it, the basic idea is that Black folks are so oppressed that there's no one that's oppressed like us anywhere in the world. And therefore, anybody that says that there's any similarity between their oppression and our oppression is lying. And therefore, there can be no alliances. Now, what Afro-pessimism is, is a very academic expression of defeat. Because basically it's saying, I mean, really think about it. If nobody is suffering like us, and if we can't trust anybody, and if in the United States we're no more than 15%, that means it's over. Um, and so that's why Afro-pessimism is promoted by some in the establishment. They like that idea because it can sound very militant. Because, you know, we're oppressed, Arr, right? But nobody, there's no allies, which means we lose. Victory comes when you're able to weave together a quilt of the oppressed and where the oppressed see themselves in that quilt, right? So it's not about, let's pretend like we don't have divisions. Of course we have divisions. And these people that would say, well, let's ignore race. If we ignore race, we can all unite and, and go off singing Kumbaya. Well, that's ridiculous. You can't ignore race. Among other things, race won't ignore you. So let's be real. So you got to figure out how to take it on. But the most important thing there is that white people have to understand, uh, the white oppressed, the poor, et cetera, that racism is not in their interests. That's part of weaving that quilt together, right? And building something that is a majority. Now, the oppressor really is very fearful of that and, and will do whatever they can to disrupt that. And, uh, and I, I wanted to say that that's one of the reasons, going back to what I said about organization, that we need to worship organization. And that very, very often, what happens in our organizations is that there are disputes and we never create mechanisms to resolve the disputes. So we end up having splits and splits and splits and more splits. And, and the enemy knows that and they'll send people into our organizations in order to create trouble. Um, and, and people end up walking away. When, in 1980, when I was living in Boston, there was an organization called the Black United Front, 
And there were provocateurs in there. I'm sure that they were police agents. And it got so dangerous that we were broken, we broke into factions and people would be bringing pistols and hatchets and knives and mace to meetings because no one ever knew whether this was gonna be the final battle. And that served the interests of the state because ultimately the organization collapsed. It couldn't, it couldn't handle that stuff. So we have to build organizations where we have mechanisms to resolve internal problems that don't involve shooting people, right? That involves resolving the differences. And sometimes that means somebody's got to go. That's true. But sometimes it means that there needs to be mediation or whatever, or respected way of resolving the differences. We're not very good at that. Uh, we're not very good at dealing with people who are substance abusers or people who have mental or emotional difficulties. We don't, we don't think about that and realizing that that can also destroy organizations. So we have to think very differently if we want to win. So Bill, in, in that vein, I do have a question for you um, because I think one of the themes that we've seen this evening or really two of the themes we've seen this evening are number one, the fact that so much of these moments in US history where the oppression from the federal level becomes severe is particularly when we see attempts to build across racial lines or regional lines, like again, the Red Scare in 1919 or mm -hmm. the more radical uh, edges of the civil rights and black power movies in the 60s and 70s and so forth. Uh, but then there's a second part that I wanna come to as well that both you and Brett have alluded to, which is how do we, how do we encourage participation from American youths in these movements? Because I have to say, as a college professor, I've noticed in the last four years or so, a great deal of cynicism amongst my students. Now, to give you full disclosure, I teach at Clafton University, which is an HBCU here in South Carolina. And so my students are mostly uh, Black American students from South Carolina or from the South in general. And many of them have I don't want to say an outright hopelessness about the future, but they are certainly deeply concerned about where things are going to the point where they often tell me they don't believe there's anything that they can do to save themselves. And as a both as a professor and as a concerned citizen, that deeply concerns me. So what do you think in terms of what strategies can be utilized to really encourage the youth to get involved because when they do get involved, they do have some really creative ideas and they tend to be more open to discussing things like organizing across racial lines, organizing across say lines of sexual orientation and so forth. But how do we speak to the youth in particular, get them really involved in these campaigns for social change? Um, so the first point is to recognize that this is not new. Right. That in periods of defeat, people become despondent. And um, they can become hopeless, feel hopeless. And we're living through a very contradictory period. Uh, so like in 2020, in the aftermath of the George Floyd murder, look at what we saw with this massive eruption. But what we also saw was the failure to build organization. And the right wing took advantage of that and has been kicking our rear ends ever since. So it's a very complicated moment that we're in. Um, but that's the first thing that we have to always keep in mind so that we keep the long view. Second thing is, this is why history is so important in general, but particularly with youth, which is precisely why people like DeSantis and others are trying to destroy history. Because when you study history, you start to get a clue to some of the answers to these questions. And that's what DeSantis and others don't want. Um, they don't want people to understand about the IWW. 
They don't want to under, they don't want people to understand what actually happened in Reconstruction. Um, they want they don't want people to understand about Cointel Pro things like that. So part of what we have to insist upon is the studying and discussion of history. Now I know that many people say, well, people don't want to read. That's not really true. Um, many people are discouraged from reading, uh, but what you have to think about is you start small. I mean, if people are reading Bibles, then they'll read all kinds of things. So let's start small and get the people that want to read reading. Now, uh, so in that sense, I think we need a new um, movement. Um, to promote reading, critical reading. But the other thing is uh, that I think that younger people are encouraged when they're supported, but not supported uncritically. Uh, just because you're young doesn't mean you're right. Just because you're old doesn't mean you're wise. Um, and, and so, one of the things though that I see that discourages younger people is that when they get into settings where people are over the age of 50 or 60, mm -hmm. frequently many of us that fall into that latter category believe that we are very wise mm -hmm. and that younger people should really just shut up and listen to us. And what we'll do, and, and I've always said that I would be, I could be a millionaire because I can guarantee you how you can clear a room of all young people. And I could patent this and sell it, right? But I'm not going to, I'm going to tell you what the secret is. If you want to make sure you clear the room of all young people, all you have to say is the following. That's not the way we do it here. That's all you need to do. And you won't have to work. Young people will disappear. Now, see, in my generation, I grew up as a child of the 60s and 70s, and we were really rambunctious. So when older people would get in our way, we would just overthrow them, right? A lot of what's happening now is younger people, as I say, they don't say hasta la vista. They say adios. They say, we're out of here. And so one of the issues has to be among older people is to engage in unity and struggle with younger activists, encouraging them, learning from them, encouraging them to learn from us, et cetera. Change the relationship. There are things that a number of younger, there are some things that I see among younger activists that give me the heebie-jeebies. Right? Like, um, I'll give you a couple of examples where many younger activists think that you don't need to do one on one in face organizing, that all you need to do is tweet, right? And text. Now, I can say with all humility that I am no expert when it comes to social media. I have so much to learn from younger activists and I keep learning. But one thing I've learned from the right is that you organize through one-on-one -on -one direct organizing and you reinforce that through the social media, right? It's, you don't, you don't replace one with the other. That people need to look in your eyes. You need to be looking at people. It's really easy for people to avoid making commitments when they're just tweeting 140 characters, right? And you're not looking at somebody and listening to them and what they're saying. So I feel like there's a lot that we can learn from one another. And that, Dr. Green, I think is part of what we've got to be thinking about in terms of engaging. It's history, it's reading, it's, it's supporting, it's engaging. It's all of these things. And recognizing that, 
You start small. One of the things that I think, for example, in 2020, there was a debate about the whole slogan, defund the police and abolish the police. And there were many younger activists that were using that slogan. I didn't use that slogan. I talked about demilitarizing the police. I talked about reallocating resources. And I was saying to many younger activists, a lot of folks in our community are not going for this defunding. They're not necessarily saying that they're not going for it, but they're not going for it. And when the protests declined, all of a sudden, it became more and more apparent that our communities were divided about how to deal with the issue of law enforcement, much more divided than we were willing to admit. Well, there were many people <clears throat> that didn't want to have that debate. I feel like we were disrespecting younger activists by not having that debate, even if we were going to be told to go to hell. It's like, no, I'm going to have that debate. Why? Because I respect you. I respect you enough that I'm going to say what my disagreement is. And people learn from that. Everybody learns from that. And it doesn't mean that I was right, but it means that we're going to have that struggle. And I think all of those things are important in terms of building our counteroffensive. That's really important to think about. And I will say, too, when we resume class at Claflin this fall, I'll make sure to show my students the clip of you saying that critical reading is important because for years now we've been saying the same thing to our students that, again, as the slogan goes, reading is fundamental, especially and including with political movements. Um, any that, other questions for Bill? That, Green, I want to stick, uh, put something in here before sure. it moves too far down the road. Because I want to, I want to talk to you about talking to young students, and also to touch on Bill's point about starting small. <clears throat> I think that we've really been working on and developing a smart strategy that's designed to do exactly what we're talking about. We just haven't marketed it. People don't know about it. We don't get any ink. But our idea of being able to pick fights where we win them, to be able to build enough power to punish or reward the people that are opposed to us, is working. Very few people know about it. Uh, <clears throat> we need more capacity. But we, we set out to change the outcome of uh, six or seven uh, state house elections in the last, I don't know, eight years maybe. And, and we've won all of them but one. And we're, we're the only organization I know of that's picking races and actually winning them. I mean, we took out the last black member of the house, put in, put in a fellow whose sister was killed at Mother Emanuel, 28 years old by doing a direct mail to registered voters under 26 years old that didn't have health insurance. Mailed nearly 4,000 postcards, targeted effort, and Gilda Cobb Hunter made a robocall with Omari's phone number. Uh, Jay Moore got into a runoff and won by like 107 votes. He didn't even know we did that. We're not doing it for the, you know, the grandeur of it. We're doing it to be able to develop the power to punish or reward. We took out the craziest Republican senator, uh, Lee Bright, some of you may remember, wanted to be the incandescent light bulb capital of the world. And he, um, we, it, there was, I think we had 80 something members or allies in Spartanburg County. They only had one sen they, one person run for senator. They were going to have a Republican senator. They could either have Lee Bright or somebody that was less crazy. And we could learn the positive power of punishment and so I talked to the guy that was the least crazy, I thought, and told him he passed our audition. He wasn't insane. He got into a runoff and he won. And so that kind of small and targeted stuff is something to talk to your young voters about, Robert, and then also point out to them the numbers, which we need to simplify. Uh, uh, um, I don't know whether, yeah, Cecil Rigby's with us tonight and he's been working with Kyle and we've got those numbers again. Where we can tell you, we get, you know, we can get it down to the county, how many young black people are, are registered, how many of them are voting. The registration numbers are remarkable. The young black people are registering like 75%, but they're not voting. It's because they don't think they can win. 
it's because they're trying to follow some kind of stupid thing from the Democratic Party saying every vote counts, go vote. There's only one candidate, you're going to lose. We got to be truthful with them. And we can show them how if they have a plan that we did with that missing voter plan, it would stretch out over a number of years and come into play during an, an off, off a midterm election when the constitutional officers are up to election. The, the constitutional officers are winning by 100,000 votes. Um, I mean, Nikki Haley won the race against um, uh, Vince for, by 59,000 votes. It's the only district that can't be gerrymandered statewide. Those 400,000 older black people that aren't that are registered by voting have got to be mobilized by that 13% of young black people that are. And when you show them the numbers, it's, it's at least a plan and you do it strategically, you do it small and you move in that direction. And so all of that is part and parcel of our, our archives and our work that we've done that we need to get people to understand. And we'll, we'll deal with that on the next couple of issues of the uh, lessons of the Majestical Plan where we talk about uh, politics. But Dr. Ben, I just want to put that out there before uh, we had to wrap it up. Sure, sure, definitely. I can't restart my video for some reason, but I'm here. Okay, well, on, on that note, actually, I do want to transition to asking Bill about something else that's very important to him. Uh, and this actually uh, takes into account something that Becky's been working on as well, which is thinking about the the cultural realm of what we're talking about this evening in terms of how do we talk about activism and organizing beyond the standard methods? How do we think about these big ideas, these big questions beyond the, the typical format? And so Bill, I know you've written uh, two novels. We kind of explore some of these ideas. Can you talk about those for a brief moment, please? Yeah, sure. Um, I, I'm sorry, I don't know what happened to the video, but anyway, um, the, um, I, I wrote The Man Who Fell From The Sky in 2018, and my second novel, which is a sequel, that just came out last month, is The Man Who Changed Colors. So I wrote the novels because um, I, well, I've come up with stories ever since I was a kid, but I spend most of my time reading and writing and speaking about real world issues, nonfiction. But what I realized in addition to fiction being a part of who I am um, is that through fiction, you can often elaborate stories that really resonate in people's heads. And, um, and, and, uh, and I, uh, an example of this, a very negative example, but it's an example nevertheless, is what I mentioned earlier, Birth of a Nation. Birth of a Nation is a work of fiction, um, but it was so powerful that it worked its way into the narrative of US history. So that even in the 1960s, it, and I remember this distinctly, if you read the Britannic Encyclopedia Britannica under, uh, about Reconstruction, the story that they elaborated was not that different from Birth of a Nation. Uh, so one thing is that when uh, fiction is strong, it can have a larger impact. But the other thing is that fiction can often help people think about things they wouldn't have thought about otherwise. Um, my two novels deal with race, justice, revenge, and Cape Verdean Americans. And I don't know how many of you know about Cape Verdean Americans. Okay, that's great because most people don't. The, they were the first post-1492 African population to come to North America voluntarily. And they came from the Cape Verde Islands, which is an archipelago 500 miles off the coast of West Africa. And they were controlled by the Portuguese until 1975. And these Cape Verdeans came as whalers and fishermen, and then they ended up bringing their families. And I wanted to explore issues of race in the United States, but I wanted to do it in a non-traditional way. And therefore, I've decided to focus on Cape Verdeans, um, who have a very different relationship because they came over, they did not come over as slaves. 
Um, and they came over, they were mainly Catholic. They did not speak English. They spoke Portuguese or Criollo, right? And they encountered this other African population that were mainly the descendants of slaves, who were mainly Protestants, who mainly spoke English. And that led to a very interesting clash, very complex relationship. And so I decided to explore issues of race um, through that. Now, some people, uh, when I told them I was writing this novel, they said, well, Bill, why don't you just write a book about Cape Verdeans? I said, because no one would read it, right? I'm not an expert about Cape Verdeans. I know enough about Cape Verdeans, but I'm not an expert. Plus, you can write a book, you know, a nonfiction book, and certain people will read it. You write a murder mystery, which is what these are, and there's a whole set of people that will read it, and as has happened, because people have said it to me, it's like, damn, I never knew anything about Cape Verdeans, and then they start becoming interested. There's a long history to that. Dashiell Hammett writing his mysteries. Uh, Walter Mosley, you know, writing his. Uh, the, the list goes on and on of progressive and leftists that have written mysteries, murder mysteries, gone into fiction. Octavia Butler writing science fiction, right? Kim Stanley Robinson writing sci uh, uh, science fiction and alternative histories. And, and people will eat that up. Um, and, and unfortunately, there's many progressives that downplay fiction unless they read it privately. And then they're, they're like almost afraid to admit that they read fiction. Uh, you know, you have magazines, progressive magazines that won't review fiction. That's what I found when my, when my book came out. That I went to a couple of publications and I said, can, you know, can I get a review? They said, oh, we don't review fiction. I said, well, what, like, why not? And they either did not respond or they gave me a ridiculous response. So I'm in a battle around that, a battle that basically is a battle about the importance of fiction because fiction creates narratives, people remember them. And it's just like when I give many of my speeches, I often talk about movies or television shows. It's, you know, like we were joking in the beginning about uh, Star Trek and about Klingons. I can't tell you how many speeches I've given where I make reference to Star Trek and people, and it resonates. And they'll, people will come up to me afterwards and say, you know, you mentioned that and bingo. Things came together. We've got to be more creative. You know, that's that's a great point. Um, as a matter of fact, I think your point about fiction, I, I want to mention a novella. It's one of my favorite novel novellas to read. It's called uh, Fire on the Mountain. I'll, I'll put it in the oh, chat. Yes. Uh, so, you, so you know the novel as well. So Fire on the Mountain, it's a, a work of alternate history, which is a subgenre of science fiction. And it poses the question, what if John Brown's raid on Harper's Ferry actually worked in 1859? And the, the turning point in the story is that Harriet Tubman, who was supposed to help John Brown, but in real life wasn't able to do the illness, actually helps him. The rebellion succeeds, and it creates this new Black state within North America. But the novel itself is not just about that event. It's about, well, what does it mean to be on the left and to dream of a better world? of an alternative world where it might not be utopia, but it's much better than what we actually have in the here and now. It raises some really provocative questions about how to think about organizing, how to think about the past. And I think, Bill, you're absolutely right. Using every tool we have at our disposal is so fundamentally important to organizing and to movement building. Uh, and I have to say, uh, my, my department chair at Claflin is actually Kate Verdian. So we've had a lot of interesting conversations over the years about her experience as a Kate Verdian woman growing up in Massachusetts, experience as a Black American in Georgia growing up in, in that, a different time period. Um, any, any closing questions? Uh, Bill, I have a quick question for you from the chat. Did anyone push you to write your novels? Was it your wife or anyone else? What's just a, a thought you had on your own? Um, it was, so, so here, here's what happened. In 2008, 
after I completed writing Solidarity Divided, I decided I was going to take a crack at fiction. And I wrote a manuscript, which never got published, but I wrote a manuscript, had a lot of fun. I gave it to an agent who said that she would read it. A few weeks later, she called me back and she trashed the manuscript. She did exactly what you should never do. And at the end of her comment, she said, and when you go back to writing nonfiction, call me. Now, yeah, I know. I mean, it's just like, wow, right? And if I hadn't loved writing the manuscript, I would have been completely crushed. So I then, over time, started envisioning a different story. And I worked it out in my head. And, and then I told my wife and my daughter, and my daughter, we were on vacation, and my daughter was looking at the floor when I was telling, and she said, Dad, I think you've got a story there, and maybe even two. And I looked at my wife, and she said, yeah, I agree. So I went about writing it. And when I completed it, I gave it to my wife, my daughter, a cousin of mine, and another friend, uh, a friend who was Cape Verdean American. And then there was another friend of mine uh, who insisted on getting a copy, even though I wasn't going to give it, but he wanted to read it. Um, and I said to them, give me the thumbs up or the thumbs down. If you don't like it, tell me. I'm not asking you to edit it. Just tell me. Um, and that's fine. I'll leave it alone. If you give me the thumbs up, I'll pursue it. They all gave me the thumbs up. And I went forward with it. Um, and I, I found um, a small publisher because I could not find an agent. Um, it, was, it was impossible. And I just kept getting turned down. But I stumbled into a small publisher and uh, who published it. And when you have a small publisher, the good news is it gets published. The bad news is that there's a small publisher. So a lot has fallen on me to try to get it out. So when I travel to try to arrange book events and things like that. Um, and when the first one came out, I got a really good response and people encouraged me to write a sequel. But, the, but what really pushed me was I went to Thanksgiving dinner with uh, some family members. And what blew me away was how much they got into the story. I mean, they were talking about the particular characters, how they envisioned the characters, and then they started encouraging me to do more. And then I went to New Bedford and I was with a Cape Verdean group at a house discussion. I was scared to death because I was afraid that they were gonna trash the book and say that it was no good. And instead they told me they loved it. And they started telling me all these ideas about how they wanted to see me to write, how they wanted to see me write even more stories. So I said, okay. So I wrote the sequel, The Man Who Changed Colors. And I've gotten great, great blurbs from people who we sent the book to um, and people that are reading it that, that really love it. And so it's, but it's a challenge <clears throat> and you've got to, I encourage people. What I have found is that everybody has a story. Everybody. There's not one person I've run into that has not said to me, you know, like <clears throat> I've been thinking about a story that I'd like to write. And I've been encouraging people as part of my mission now to write novels or short stories. So um, that's that's what I did. That was the, you know, and it's been fun and challenging. All right. Can I, can I just add before we wrap, Robert? Real, Go ahead. Um, I think that um, this is really, really critical, important, imp the, the whole notion of using all the tools at your disposal, as you were suggesting, is that what has been missing in South Carolina for a long time is um, 
is our own media outlets. We, for, for 10 years, Brett and I put out a newspaper called Point, and it was a really important resource. And that closed, we went from 1990 to 2000. And since then, nothing's really come on the scene to replace it. And I think without having a place to run, on, run our own stories and create our own content, um, and or creating podcasts, but to rely on the mainstream media to get our message out anymore with, a, with an increasingly shrinking media market out there, um, it's getting really, really difficult to get our messages out. And so we can't rely on reporters to show up. We have had you know, wonderful campaigns and, and all the greatest talking points in the world, but if people don't get your message, then it's all kind of moot, isn't it? So um, I would just encourage all of the people that are interested in doing serious organizing to also get serious about creating mechanisms for um, creating your own content and ways to broadcast your own message without having to rely on the old tools, which are no longer as available as they used to be. Absolutely. And that includes low power FM radio. It includes, um, you know, developing web magazines. Um, uh, but in doing all of this, keep in mind that none of this operates on the basis of magic, right? There need to be dollars. We need to be even, and this is one of the things that's deceptive about the web. Since so much is free, people assume everything is free. And, and the reality is in order to move stuff, and particularly to move good journalism, you need money. So we need to think about alternative ways of raising resources in order to do exactly what Becky is raising. There's, right, the one final thing there is also taking advantage of mainstream media, including a better use of letters to the editor and op-eds. So what the right understands much better than us is echo chambers. Right? So they get people who will write things and they'll write things uh, about different issues and, they'll, and each time they'll make it appear that they themselves came up with this brilliant idea when in fact they've gotten the talking points through the Heritage Foundation. We have to have echo chambers and we're terrible at it. You know, Brett might write a letter to an editor about something and nobody else writes about the same thing. So we got to figure out like in South Carolina, how do we create echo chambers? Anyway, I just wanted to add that to what you were raising, Becky. No, that's a, that's a great point. And let's once again, give Bill Fletcher a great round of applause. Thank you so much for coming out class this evening. Um, a lot of lessons to really take from that. A lot of things to think about that we'll come back to during the course of this semester. Um, speaking of which, our next couple of classes, I think relate very closely to what Bill was talking about this evening. Uh, this coming Sunday, we do have a Sunday session from four to six, which is all about the Orangeburg Massacre. And of course, uh, Cecil Williams, the famed photographer, will be joining us to talk a bit about the Orangeburg Massacre. And we'll also view the documentary, Scar Justice, which was released in 2009 and really brings to light the tragedy of that particular evening in February of 1968. And the next Monday, we'll be talking a bit more about what Bill was talking about with the 60s and 70s, uh, including talking about it both from a historical perspective and also talking about it a bit from what Brett was seeing on the ground um, as an activist during that time period as well. So this Sunday from four to six, we have the Scar Justice and Orangeburg Massacre discussion. And then next Monday, we're talking about the 60s and 70s, an era of change, an era of revolution, and also, most importantly, an era of counter-revolution as well. Brett, have anything to add to that? Dr. Green, I, I want to thank Bill for setting me up to tell the students here that have pledged to pay some tuition, that if they haven't done so, do so. And that uh, for the next class, we haven't mailed books uh, that Becky had finished her generations know about the radical movement in South Carolina. And if you're in the room there, pick up the book. If you are paying full tuition, that's your book. If you're not, we'd like $10 dropped in the basket before you leave or slip it in, a, in Dr. Green's pocket. But we really, the movement has to have money to be able to produce 
propaganda, and so y'all help us out there because this is good stuff. Becky spent two years writing that book. And one of the things that um, we will share more of and put it online, that Dr. Green, you can use this to amuse and amaze your students. I thought in the 60s, all this stuff we were hearing about, about um, uh, provocateurs, agent provocateurs, and the things that the FBI was doing, that the person the, the, that was drawing those nasty ca cartoons for the Black Panthers was, a, was an FBI agent. And we now have access to the COINTELPRO papers where they're just jaw dropping. They, I mean, literally coming into meetings at the university that we were organizing with the intent of starting people fighting against each other. And so they, they play hardball, they play dirty. And so this is some stuff that is really interesting reading for the young, young folks. And we'll put that online you can share it. So we hope to see you again uh, this, uh, this coming Sunday for Cecil Williams. And Bill Fletcher, don't be a stranger. We need you down here. And let me tell you that Bill is down here helping out with a very important organizing plan that you'll be hearing more of about Henry McMaster uh, trying to um, fight unions in the way of the Longshoremen unions. Uh, and it's a, it's a really a one-off thing where he's the only guy in the, in the, the only man that has a port in this state that's doing this. We'll keep you posted. And thank you again, Bill. And thank everybody for coming. Thank you so much. Have a good evening, everyone. Thank you.